Hello there friends and welcome to JJ Painting and Reviews. I am JJ and today I want to talk about Primogenitor, a Fabius Bile novel by Josh Reynolds. And we will be painting, in fact, Fabius Bile himself today. Um, the first thing I want to say about this novel is that Fabius is a classic character and this is actually his second incarnation. And he's one of those characters who I think is well overdue a book series. So let's dive straight in. A little bit of an unboxing here for you all. Ooh, exciting. So here we go. Yes, I do spray my models on the sprue and I do paint them on sprue as well. This is just so that I can get into all the little nooks and crannies. We will stick him together in another episode. Now, on to the review. Primogenitor is set in the Warhammer 40,000 universe and is, unsurprisingly, about Fabius Bile, as you can see his face is all over the front cover. A classic character from the canon nonetheless. But for those of you who don't know him that well, Fabius is an apothecary by trade, a surgeon that is vital in the creation of the new space marines, who are genetically engineered super soldiers. He was in fact chief apothecary to an entire legion of these guys, called the Empress Children, before their treacherous actions and banishment in the Horus Heresy series, the Horus Heresy being a cataclysmic event that shaped the Warhammer 40,000 universe, and it was this that made Fabius' legion collapse and they slid completely into debauchery and masochism in the name of a new patron god, Slanesh, also known as the Prince of Pleasure. And if you feel like I'm explaining quite a lot here, then we'll get to that in a little bit. We start the book with Fabius living in his self-imposed exile from his former legion, having gathered a coalition of other apothecaries from other space marine legions around him and named them the Consortium, who have come to learn from him and help him in conducting his own experiments. So as you can see, Fabius has parted ways with his legion, and he didn't agree with them fundamentally. He didn't like what they become, and he didn't see himself being able to keep working with them. So he made a massive leap of faith and he left, which is a very risky move. When a former student of his called Oleander arrives with a proposition, he needs Fabius's help in acquiring a huge prize that would be beneficial to Fabius's own research and to Oleander's new master, another former member of the Emperor's Children Legion called Kasperos Telemar, although he calls himself get this, the Radiant King in his joyful repose, or just the Radiant for short. Thanks very much, Josh Reynolds, for that A-plus naming. I'm, I'm joking, it's actually a fantastic name. And as a side note, the number of um, ridiculously over-the-top names there are in the Warhammer 40,000 universe is just bonkers when you actually sit down and think about it. My God, their passports must be six feet long. Anyway, an intrigue does begin to emerge around Oleander's motives for enlisting Fabius's help, and not everything is as it seems, and Fabius himself is going to be called upon to make some choices. Now, the story itself is told from the perspective of both Fabius and Oleander, and it gives us a really interesting insight into how different the two leads are. They have a history together, both being from the Empress Children Legion, but where Fabius has cut ties with the Legion and has his own agenda now, Oleander is trying to find that sense of belonging and brotherhood he had during the days of the Legion. As a long-term reader of the Black Library books, this really struck me throughout because these characters are looking to each other for a purpose, and when they can't find it, or they realise that what their purpose was has now changed or they can no longer achieve it, it actually makes them more destructive. So a lot of them have had to become mercenaries or bandits in a weird way, trying to relive the glory days of yore, but it doesn't work because the glories they had have faded. And one of the big things about this book is just how broken these people have become. And even though they are genetically engineered super soldiers, they are very much off the path that was forged for them. And this is the first novel that gives an insight into Fabius Bile's mind. And it shows that he's more than just a mad scientist. Fabius, in many ways, has a drive and a clarity of vision for the future, not just of himself or other space marines, but for mankind as a whole. And that is rare in a Warhammer 40,000 novel. Most character motivations tend to be revolved around protecting what you have left or destroying someone else's empire. This is different because it's rare to see someone trying to build something that's designed to last. And whilst his methods are ruthless and utterly without remorse, Fabius himself has a reason for this. He's running on borrowed time. In the canon, the Empress Children Legion was struck by a disease, and Fabius is one of the last surviving legionaries to have this illness. As such, he has had to f clone himself, because he can't 
cure the disease in his own body, he has to clone his imperfect, damaged body over and over again to keep himself alive in order to carry on his work. And one of the interesting things that Primogenitor sets up is that Fabius, despite being a genetically engineered super soldier, is also vulnerable and weakened. He's been left in a diminished state by the centuries of cloning himself using the imperfect materials that he is made from. And you really do feel sorry for him. I felt, personally, a lot of pity for him in this book, as he's not only very aware he's running out of time, but he's frustrated at his own mortality. And imagine that as a concept. Every time you die, you can clone yourself to bring yourself back to life, but each body lasts slightly less time, and you have the same diseases and the same weaknesses that your last body had. That is terrifying to think about. It would drive anyone insane, but not Fabius, and this is why he's so interesting. This is what really makes Primogenitor stand out among the many novels about space marines for me, especially Chaos Space Marines. A lot of the other books go into details about how broken the other legions are, as I said earlier, but it is rare to see how it has broken some of the individuals and what they do with their situation. However, what makes him so compelling for me is that he is still pursuing his work, and seeing what he creates in this novel makes it really worth reading, knowing that his machinations have borne fruit beyond the mutants and the monstrosities that you read in some of the other books. His gland hounds, which are a new thing he's created, are a type of genetically engineered human, not quite space marines, but certainly dangerous, and they form the backbone of his personal bodyguard. I was really intrigued by them to know that Fabius has created something so dangerous, but also so human. The gland hands aren't monsters. They are violent, but they're resourceful, they're cunning, and they're loyal to their master, and it shows that Fabius doesn't just want to create horrific abominations. He's trying to improve on what's already there. Even though it is a different style of novel, it works very well, especially in the Warhammer context. Yes, there's lots of action, as you'd like, and there's lots of fighting and lots of combat, as in many of the other novels you see around the subject, but the weight to them is slightly different. Knowing that Fabius is not invincible, even the way some of his allies run around and fight, really gives it a different sense to the action and the violence, because we all know, reading it, that Fabius may be able to hold his own, but he's not going to be able to fight the way his brothers do. And that's something which is really interesting and very much worth keeping in mind when you read these books. And it's a nice thing to have um, Space Marine as a difference from the normally invincible, because in other books some of them die. That's not a spoiler, Space Marines die in other books, but we're not talking about other books, talking about this one. Anyway, the plot moves along at a very good pace as well, because everything in the book is very time sensitive. It feels like everyone's objectives can only be achieved within a very limited window, which drives them all um, to move as quickly as they possibly can, and it puts the stakes up as the plot proceeds. And even though the characters are very active, they know they can't control every force around them. Fabius is aware that he's working with people that he doesn't necessarily control, especially in the forms of Oleander and his master. Oleander is aware that Fabius has got his eye on them. So there's very little trust, and that makes an interesting atmosphere which really tells you the story about these people's relationship, that even though they all have this history, not everyone's on board with each other. Now, speaking of history, as I said earlier, there was lots of explaining. And this gets me on to my next point. For me, the biggest weakness and the biggest issue I have with this book is that you need a pre-existing understanding of the Warhammer universe to really get into it. Now, I've been reading the Black Library novels for well over a decade, so I pretty much knew where we were and who was what from the word go. However, I'm aware this won't apply to everyone who reads it. And for those watching who are just getting into the novels, or are perhaps brand new, or have stumbled onto this video by accident, looking for something else, in which case, hey, how's it going? And you're wondering, maybe, what the Horus Heresy is, or what Space Marine Legions are, or who is Slanesh. This is particularly relevant. Primogenitor is not an entry-level novel for people looking to get into the Black Library series. I'll leave a list of books in the description that are good if you're just getting started, uh, and also some links to a few articles that tell you the outlines of the things I mentioned earlier. But, and it is a shame, because the world building around Fabius is done so well in this book, but it does have a tendency to lean upon these other sources for the characters to make sense at times. This is best represented by this line, for years after the fall of Canticle City, his foes had hounded him, not just rivals and renegades, but Eldar and worse things. His chosen course has set him at odds with a thousand factions, and all of them wanted him in chains or dead. 
Now, that's a fantastic setup for a character. And I think that tells you everything you need to about Fabius. The trouble is, though, we don't get a lot of detail as to who those forces are in this book, which for me is a bit of a missed opportunity. Another shorter quote, which really hits the nail on the head, is this, uh, from a character called Ariane who's speaking to Oleander. Brotherhood isn't solely determined by blood. A lesson I learned on Scalathrax. Oleander swatted his hand away. We all learned lessons on Scalathrax. Now, Scalathrax was a big event which pitted the Emperor's Children Legion against another legion called the World Eaters, which Ariane used to be a part of. Again, for those of you who know the lore, you will understand this statement, but those who don't will be unaware of the significance of what is being said and how it has shaped these characters. Now, all that being said, for those of you who are familiar with the universe, it is quite a unique take on the perspectives and the motivations of such a well-known character especially one who is presented as the bad guy in just about everything else he's portrayed in. But another thing I want to mention is that this is very much, I won't spoil, that are left a smidge unresolved at the end of the book, but are clearly set up to be significant later. These do have a take up quite a significant chunk of the book, which I feel could have been used to flesh out some of the plot points in this book. Fabius's aforementioned gland hounds, for example, they feature quite heavily in part one, and Fabius himself stresses their significance, but they themselves aren't able to do much once the main plot gets underway. And having said all that, it's a bit of a shame, but that doesn't take away from the fact that, as I'm sure you will have realised, I think that the greatest strength of this book is that Fabius is so weak, and you see how it affects him. Fabius is the best thing in his book, as he should be, the stakes are high for him, especially as he has a goal he is working towards, something which is rare for characters in the universe, and it's another great strength in the novel. Another great strength in this novel is the really tight focus on the characters that lets the intrigue around Fabius and Oleander's journey develop, and they complement each other as the story progresses, like I was saying earlier. And when we see how they interact with their host of support characters and the Radiant, this is where we really get to see Fabius in action for the person he is, but also how he differs from Oleander in a lot of very fundamental ways, and what makes, in some ways, Fabius more than just a space marine. I won't go into the reveals and twists, but they are certainly one of the most interesting things about this book. Josh Reynolds builds up so much suspense with these characters and the payoffs hit the right notes, especially when you come to see how they all tie together in the end and leaves the book in a position where the next instalment is something which is worth reading. So to conclude, would I recommend the book? Yes. Why? It's a new take on a classic character and it sets up a bigger story. It's an intriguing and fast-paced novel where the characters are very active, the protagonists take control of the plot and they run with it. They aren't buffeted around by fate, they aren't allowed to be caught up in other events, they are very much trying to take control of their own destiny. And where it succeeds, it's worth celebrating. And where they fail, for some of them, it almost feels tragic, but the struggle is what really human they are. will leave you feeling pity and sympathy for Fabius, and it certainly left me wanting to see what he does next. He has had a fantastic outing in this book. Anyway, I think that's all the time we have for today, and I think that's all I'm going to paint of Fabius himself. I'm sure his ears are burning, having spent the last 15 minutes listening to me talk about him in such a manner. So, first of all, thank you very much for watching. I will be doing the Clone Lord and Man Flayer reviews, and I will be painting Fabius and his little friend. Um, like and subscribe. Thank you so much for watching. Have a wonderful day wherever you are, and hopefully I will see you next time. Take care, friends. Bye-bye.